Hey. Um, so um, I'm Ian. I'm an accessibility specialist. And as Tara mentioned, I'm also a co-conspirator for all this today. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm going to kick off with a little bit of a chat about some of the various things that have been going on in the field over the past year. Um, one of those things that's happened is I hit the 10-year mark of working um, in this field. And over those 10 years, the, the industry has transformed it completely. It's unrecognizable now. Uh, but particularly in the last year, in the last year, there's been a real sea change in the um, understanding and attitudes and implementation um, of accessibility around the industry. And a lot of those things, this, this is kind of stuff that's happening internally within studios. So kind of the impact of it won't be felt for another kind of year or two down the line. But there is quite a bit that is, that is kind of available publicly. So I'm just going to talk through a few of those things that have been going on. And as with last year, there's, there's been way too much to be able to cover everything in the course of this talk. So I'm just going to briefly go through a few kind of common threads that there have been. So platforms, initiatives, dialogue with gamers, high level support, legislation, and the games themselves. Starting with platforms. So I'm just going to pick two platforms to talk about here. So this is the Xbox and the Nintendo Switch. And I've chosen these two to talk about for, for really quite different reasons. So firstly, the Xbox. Um, I'm talking about the Xbox because they've really been knocking out of the park over the past year with a ton of successive updates to functionality on the console. So things like um, upgrades to existing functionality, like the um, system level zoom, upgrading that so you can lock it in place and play the game while zoomed in. Upgrading narrator, which is a text-to-speech for blind gamers, upgrading that so that there's a new navigation mode in there. Um, also making that text-to-speech available through an API, so developers now are able to um, have spoken UIs in games that sat there in the SDK waiting to be used. Um, also a high contrast flag that you can access to find out if a player's got a preference for that, which you can then apply in your game. Something that has um, really, really um, been interesting is a new feature called Copilot Mode. Um, Copilot Mode basically allows you to plug in a second controller, which then does exactly the same thing as the first controller. And that opens up all kinds of interesting applications. You might, for example, have um, a kid who sat there playing a game, and that can jump on the second controller and help them out without having to take the controller off them. You might have, for example, a blind gamer who's playing, who can manage stuff like the shooting, finds navigating the environment challenging, someone sat next to them navigating the environment is helping them out. You can also have both controllers controlled by the same person. So for example, you could have half of one controller controlled using your left hand, half of the other controller controlled using your foot, if, for example, you've got one hand. So all kinds of nice applications. It's a kind of thing that's such a simple idea that you kind of wonder why it wasn't done before. So that's been really, really nice to see those kind of advancements. Um, on the other side, we've got the Switch. Um, now, the Switch last year um, introduced um, some accessibility features aimed at people with low vision. And the reason why this is really, really notable is because that, what that equates to is every single major gaming platform now, so in that, and I'm including the Switch, the Xbox, PS4, iOS, Android, PC, they all have options in their design specifically for games with disabilities. And I generally try and shy away from claiming that things are a first, because that's normally a good way to guarantee that they aren't. But this one, I am absolutely certain about. This is the first time in the history of the industry that all, those major, that all the major platforms available at the time have got those kind of options in. That's a Yep, I couldn't agree more. That's something that we really need to recognize and celebrate. It's a big step forward. So, on that note, even with these advances, there's still a lot more that can be done. So something else that came about over the past year was the IGDA's Accessibility SIG launching platform accessibility guidelines. So this is a whole bunch of suggestions of features that can be implemented at operating system and hardware level to help improve accessibility. So we've got the link up there. If anyone there in the room is involved with working on operating systems on hardware, I recommend checking that out. So next, a really strong thread that there's been over the past year has been um, initiatives, initiatives taking place, um, some of them privately, a lot of them publicly, with uh, major players in the industry. 
So starting off at the very start of the year, Global Game Jam, um, with uh, ESA sponsoring an accessibility diversifier, um, which is also obviously um, a great tool for the people that are taking part in it, but also a huge awareness raising tool as well for all the people that look at the Global Game Jam website. PSX, reception for gamers with disabilities at PlayStation's event. Microsoft holding their internal Access Gamers, gamers and Disabilities boot camp, which is essentially it's a one day conference similar to this about awareness raising, guest speakers. This is um, Wolf Rachel engaged up on the screen at the event. Similar event at PlayStation. So this is Josh here with uh, Shay Yishida. And this was a similar kind of event, um, <coughs> guest speakers, awareness raising, demos, that kind of thing. And this actually took part as um, part of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. That is an event that happens every year uh, during May, and that covers all kinds of industries. People coming together to do things like this, uh, make, uh, run the awareness raising events, smaller activities like all kinds of other organisations, doing talks, running events, blogging, tweeting, all that kind of stuff. And this year there was a huge, huge uptake from the games industry. Um, not just these two, but other companies um, like Guy Kai, like um, BBC, like Funker, all running loads of really nice things. And again, this is going to happen again in May this year. So if you ever need an excuse to be shouting about accessibility, whether it's internally, whether it's to, whether it's to the um, general public, then that is an ideal opportunity to do it. But in addition to these kind of uh, one-off um, initiatives, there's also some permanent ones as well, like the Microsoft Inclusive Design Lab. Technology Lab. Inclusive Technology Lab, sorry. <laughs> that thing, anyway. So this is basically a, a permanent installation that is now present at Microsoft. And you can see here there's some people playing with some uh, uh, vision impairment simulator glasses. And there's also all kinds of various examples of accessibility technology there for people to play with. So it's basically aimed at giving people insight into how this technology works, uh, letting people have a bit of empathy and understanding about accessibility. And it's also open to the public as well. They take bookings. So if you want to go and check it out, um, find Bryce, Bryce Johnson. He's around here today. That's the guy on the left. Um, also, there is a talk on Wednesday, right? Wednesday, 9.30. Wednesday, 9.30. Plug for the talk. So there's a plug on Wednesday about um, the process of setting this up and why and how you can do that yourself. Next, this is a really important one. Um, this is about a person. <laughs> the person who's giggling in the front row at the moment. <laughs> so Karen Stevens. So Karen was doing a lot of good um, accessibility work um, over at EA, and she has now been made um, the accessibility lead for EA Sports. So she now has a permanent full-time in-house role at a publisher. And that has made an enormous difference in the work, not just that she's able to do within the EA Sports, but within the whole organisation. It's really paying huge dividends. And that's something that the industry really, really needs more of. In other industries, this kind of thing is common. In like big corporations and stuff, you expect there's going to be full-time permanent accessibility stuff. The games industry needs more of this. And there are, um, I can think, probably a good three or four people in this room who are in the same kind of situation that Karen was in this time last year, who are trying to do really good stuff or would love to do more. So if you're in any position to give these people full-time jobs, you should do it. And um, as part of Karen's responsibilities, um, you can see here, talking about providing game feedback, um, building greater relationships with the community. That has been another really, really strong thread running throughout the past year. Whether it's initiatives like this, whether it's kind of like big, wide-scale formative research like Ubisoft's um, survey um, of gamers with disabilities, all the way down to individual stuff with like individual producers seeing a game with disability, tweeting about an accessibility issue and jumping straight on it, wanting to hear what, they, what, what they've got to say, wanting to do something about it. And that has been, in the past year, a huge, huge increase in that. And off the back of that, that increasing demand, that greater interest um, for studios to, to have that dialogue, to involve people with disabilities in the design process, uh, something else that came about last year is uh, um, an initiative by Able Gamers called the Player Panels Initiative. 
And that is essentially, uh, there's a lot of people in the room who are working in user research and, and UX. This is essentially a recruitment database for gamers with disabilities to take part in playtesting, take part in user, re user research. And the gamers are here today, I'm sure they would love to speak to you about it. And all of these, all these initiatives, all this nice stuff that's been doing, that's been going on at these big companies, um, wouldn't be possible without high-level support, without people in the more senior levels of management um, getting behind accessibility, caring about it, and talking publicly about it as well. So I've got a few examples of that. So there's some people in the room who may be able to read these quotes, so I'm going to read them out. So the first one, on the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Xbox celebrates all gamers really proud of the team's commitment to make fun gaming experiences for everyone. And that's Mike Ibarra, Corporate VP of Gaming at Microsoft. Just spent some time with Sightless Combat again. His love of gaming and work to make gaming accessible to everyone is inspiring. And that's Phil Spencer, head of Xbox. It was very inspirational to hear Josh talk about accessibility in games what impact we developers can have on the lives of many people. And that's Shohi Yushida, president of Worldwide Studios. So. And this kind of stuff, these quotes, and this has continued into this year. It's becoming increasingly common to see these kind of like really big names in the industry making these public statements about the importance of accessibility, about spending time with the audience. And, and you know, even just a few short years ago, this kind of stuff would have been unimaginable. It really is a huge change in the industry. I've got one more quote from you. This is actually a quote from somebody outside the industry. <laughs> so today, all Kim Kardashian game UK revenue will go towards helping disabled gamers by Kim Kardashian. So the reason I've got this up on the screen, this was actually in conjunction with a fundraiser with special effects, which is a great thing in itself. But the reason why this is important is because Kim Kardashian is in one of the top 10 most followed people on Twitter. She has an audience of 60 million followers. So just like the people in the room who are involved in the accuracy will understand the importance of this. Just getting those words, disabled gamers, getting that broadcast to an audience of 60 million people is just an incredible piece of awareness raising. And that kind of broad mass market awareness raising has been happening in the media as well. So we've got coverage here from The Economist talking about the business case for accessibility in gaming. BBC News, this is an article on blind accessibility in gaming, a video piece even. So we've got here again Phil Spencer telling BBC News how much he wants to make sure that games and consoles that Xbox build are accessible to any kind of player. And I really can't understate the importance of this like big, broad advocacy efforts. The impact that it makes, not just on awareness, but also on the acceptance of disability and accessibility in the wider community. So next up, legislation. So this is a couple of things that happened um, right at the end of uh, 2017. Um, the first one is one that, uh, that I, I know a decent chunk of people in the room are familiar with, which is uh, CVAA, 21st Century Communications Video and Accessibility Act. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because Karen's going to be up next speaking about it. Um, but essentially, this is, this is a law that requires communications technology across all industries um, to be accessible to people with disabilities. And the games industry, I mean, you can see here, this is, this is the law actually being signed in. Um, this is Obama signing it, so you can see it's not a new thing. It was actually signed in in 2010. And the games industry has had a series of waivers to allow like, some time to work out implementation, that kind of stuff. And in December, um, the final deadline for that was set. The last waiver is going to expire at the end of 2018. So if you're working on a game that involves communication, and it's launching after the end of 2018. This is something you really need to know about. So that's something that a lot of people know about, CVAA. Um, something that not so many people know about is this, the European Accessibility Act. So this, this, actually, this actually hit pretty much the same time as the announcement of the um, final waiver expiry date for CVAA. And what this is, um, this is uh, slightly broader than CVEA. Um, it, it covers all different kinds of areas of accessibility, but the ones that relate to game development are communication in the same way as CVEA. It also expands out into e-commerce as well. And another difference with it is, um, is, although the basics of it are quite similar, the actual nature of the requirements is different, the requirements even. 
So it's based on individual features rather than performance objectives, which you'll hear a bit more about in a bit. But basically where CVA might say, um, you need to have a mode that works with people with low vision. The European Accessibility Act would say, you need to be able to change the size of the font. So it's a bit more specific about requirements. So what's the actual state of this? This isn't actually going to hit for quite a long time yet. So basically the, um, the European Council, um, which represents all the different member countries of the EU, has agreed the general approach. So the structure of the legislation, what the requirements are going to be, that kind of stuff. Um, over the course of 2018, they then negotiate with the other two branches of the European government, the um, Commission and the Parliament, to turn it into a law. After that, again, as with CVA, there will be a lengthy waiver period of quite a number of years before the compliance deadline hits. So this kind of stuff isn't going to come for like a long time until it, until it affects games, but obviously there's nothing stopping people getting ahead of the curve, and it's really, really helpful to have this kind of visibility of stuff that's going to be coming further down the line. So, so far I've talked about, um, talked about platforms, talked about kind of corporate initiatives, talked about um, engaging with the audience, the high level support legislation. All this stuff is kind of stuff that sits around games. As for the games themselves, there's been a ton of nice stuff happening over the past year as well. There's been a lot of games which are going back in and patching accessibility functionality into existing titles. So like this in Overwatch, captioning coming to Overwatch. Madden. So Madden 18 has had haptic cues um, patched in to allow the gameplay to be fully accessible to people who are blind. Vaporum, this was a nice one. They patched in what is basically super hot mode. So you can turn the setting on and the game, when you're not moving, is paused. So at any point, you can just stop, the rest of the game will pause, and you can have a break. Whether this is for cognitive reasons, whether this is motor reasons, you've got a chance to stop and take, stop and take stock. Mario Kart. So when Mario Kart 8 came to the Switch, they had um, assists added in for acceleration, for steering, and that's opened up some huge opportunities for players who weren't able to play the game before at all. Code 7, another game that's had blind accessibility patched in. And there's also, of course, been the really nice stuff that's um, come about when games have been launched that was developed during the regular development process. Like Nier. Nier's auto chips to allow automation of certain areas of gameplay. She remembered Caterpillars. This is a really, really lovely implementation of colorblind support. So you can see here, basically this is, um, is an additive system. So you have the red and the blue. You also have purple, which is a mix of the two colors. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, if you go back, if you go back just a couple of years ago, the idea of a game that's about mixing colors together, that would just have been written off as, you know, this is fundamentally what the game is about. That can't be colorblind friendly. But you can see they've got a really nice approach. They, as well as the colors being additive, they've come up with a symbol system that's also additive. So you can see you've got the square and the circle. And then the purple is a mix of both the square and the circle. And that's also reflected in the body shapes of the caterpillars as well. So it really uh, fits nicely with the aesthetic style of the game. So that's a nice example of, I mean, if, if, if the game had been developed without considering colour blindness, and you go back in and try and patch it at the end, you wouldn't get anything that's anywhere near as nicely integrated as this. So it's a really nice example of the benefits of thinking about accessibility early in the process. And games that have got a wide range of considerations as well, like Forza 7 here. Obviously, this is at the, at the high, like, AAA end of the industry. The same down the other end of the industry as well. So this, this, this range of features, um, this is in a game called Midboss, which is developed by a single one-person indie development studio. And this isn't everything they included as well. They had other stuff in there as well, like consideration for color blindness and for simulation sickness as well. And again, so this is another ex nice example of thinking about accessibility early in the process, that all this stuff was done by you know, one single developer just because they thought about it early enough in development. And 
And lastly, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is subtitling. So this is from um, Hitman. And I actually found out about this by someone in the room today saying that it made their day, finding out about this. Uh, it made my day as well. So seeing control over subtitle size. Um, this is something that is starting, starting to slowly creep into games. So it's something that is standard in other industries. In some industries, if you're working in broadcast video um, in the USA, it's actually required. Um, and it's really important because basically in subtitles you have kind of different use cases. You've got some people who might only glance at the subtitles occasionally if they happen to miss a word because of an explosion going off, who want those subtitles to be really subtle and unobtrusive. Other people who are completely reliant on subtitles, who need those subtitles to be as clear and easy to read as possible at all times. So these kind of things, offering this kind of, this kind of customization, allows you to reach all these different use cases. Another example of that, this is from Assassin's Creed Origins. So this is a different kind of options. You've just got two very simple options here. You can see you've got the option to turn on um, the name of the person who's speaking. You've also got the option to turn on and off the subtitle background. So again, this is really important for these different use cases, people who need it to be clear. One that people don't often think about actually is dyslexia. So you get a lot of people with dyslexia who find it really, really difficult to read text when the letter shape is being interfered with by the visuals behind it. So actually having the option to turn on that solid black background can be really, really helpful. And that feature again, like being able to turn, turn that black box off and on um, is standard in other industries. Um, I'm gonna give you a list now of all the games I'm aware of in the games industry that have ever implemented that option to turn that black box on and off. Assassin's Creed Origin and um, I can't remember the name. <laughs> Life is Strange. Life is Strange. Thank you. Life is Strange. Yeah. Mind blank. Yeah, so uh, um, Assassin's Creed Origins and Life is Strange. Um, two games. And that feature, to turn that black box on and off, like how difficult is that? And it's had really good results as well. Um, the, the, the praise that there's been um, on social media, and I presume directly as well, that Ubisoft received over this has is, is been really quite something. For something that really was not very much work at all. Um, and something else actually that, um, that Ubisoft have done now, they've actually released some data on this. So on average, across all of the platforms that um, Assassin's Creed Orange was, uh, Origins was released on, um, over 60% of their players play with subtitles turned on. So that's literally millions of players using these features. So if you've got a feature like this that is so relied on by such a majority of your players, it really, really deserves putting some decent design time into it. And it can be really, really simple stuff like this. So I'd really, really love to see this in particular become more standardized. Um, there's, there's lots of good resources out there on good practices, things that can be learned from other industries. Um, please chat to me afterwards and I can point you in the direction of some of those resources. There's a lot of stuff you can do very, very easily that will make a huge difference to the experiences of very large numbers of your players. So I'm going to wrap up now. I'm going to wrap up by actually moving a bit outside of games to talk about Star Wars. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so Star Wars. Why am I talking about Star Wars? Um, I'm talking about Star Wars because of this number. So this is the uh, UK sales figures for Rogue One. So Rogue One sold 1.38 million copies in the UK, and that's across both digital and box media. Um, it wasn't actually the most popular film of the year. Um, Beauty and the Beast actually slightly pipped to the post. They had about 1.4 million sales in the UK. Sorry, what was the title of that? Uh, oh, Beauty and the Beast. Call of Duty World War II, 2.44 million. FIFA, 2.69 million. And this is the same the previous year as well. FIFA outsold Force Awakens. So games literally are bigger than Star Wars. <laughs> and there's a serious point behind this because Star Wars is a huge cultural phenomenon. And games are too. So this is the reason I wanted to bring this up was because, you know, you often hear a lot about like the business case and the human benefit of accessibility. I just wanted to leave you with a thought about this, which is the cultural significance of games, how important games are, how deeply entrenched they are into our society. You are bombarded by messages about games in the media. All your friends are talking about games. It's a really, really important part of our society now. That also makes it a really, really 
significant thing to be excluded from. And people don't have to be. I mean, you can see from the kind of stuff I've been talking about that you know, it really is changing. The tools and the knowledge are there now. Despite the progress being made, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, there is still a mountain to climb, um, partially, although not so much now about awareness raising. That battle is beginning to be won. There's still a lot of work to be done on consolidation, on standardization, on workflows, on processes, on staffing. But that is being done now. That high level backing input is in place and we are on the path. So the future is looking very bright. <laughs> oh, come on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>